This first one is Sister Circus Tenuai Collis. It has a migratory stage through the liver and produces hemorrhagic tracts and then attaches to cirrhosal surfaces in the abdominal cavity, quite common at the meat export avatar. This is called Sister Circus Ovis or the Metacestode of Tenia Ovis. It's quite common at the abattoirs. It has a predilection for striated muscle. Therefore, it is a common cause of condemnation of the carcass. These next three show the metacestode of Echinococcus granulosus, which is high doubt it's. The uh, previous two, Sister Circus, has one skull X. This particular one has many, many scolices. We call them high dadded sand and many, many cysts. They're quite viable in uh, cattle as well as sheep. Textbooks used to say that 90% of them in cattle were infertile. Uh, Roger Cook and I did a little survey and found that more than 70% of them were fertile in cattle. The second one shows the multiple cysts in the, in the lungs. This third one shows the cysts opened up. One can do a parasitic membrane test when you just pull out the germinal layer to get a positive test. Now these three uh, tapeworm cysts could be easily controlled in Australia by simply dosing the, the dog. The dog's the main host. But somehow we, in Australia we haven't got around to doing that. We have a system called the uh, Australian Animal Health System and there's a lack of coordination at the abattoir level right through to the farm level. New Zealand eradicated these. They cost Australia many, many millions and also, as you know, I doubt it is a zoonotic disease. So it needs a lot more coordination between the various parties if we're going to eradicate this disease. The debt, the waste is continuous, it, uh, doesn't abate, completely unacceptable as far as the Australian animal health system is concerned with uh, reducing debt. Now here we have a condition called intestinal adenocarcinoma of the sheep. The lesion is located at the ilio-jejunal junction area. The first picture here shows the cancer opened up just above the page there. So we go on to the next one, which is much closer, and one can see the distinct difference in the mucosa between the affected adenocarcinoma and the uh, normal down at the bottom right. In the um, mesothelium is a uh, white plaques they vary they some more diffuse and some more focal that is illustrating the extension of the adenocarcinoma into these areas however there's a, a problem in the quite often at the avatars we can't find the actual small intestinal lesion but dr tony ross who did his phd on this subject insists that it's there you can see that that white diffuse area in the mesothelium. So at the abattoirs, it's it's usually called mesothelioma, which could be a, a misname according to uh, Dr. Ross. So the, the next one shows the plaques we're talking about. And quite frequently, I personally have, have gone right through the small intestine and I couldn't find the lesion that I showed you before. There is a thing called um, epithelial mesothelioma or epithelioid mesothelioma in the human literature. And so there's a bit of controversy there about this particular disease. The white plaques are distributed throughout the cirrhosal surfaces, the visceral and parietal coats, in various numbers and various sizes. And so it indicates that it's some sort of multicentric spontaneous growth of these particular plaques and therefore that classification of this uh, particular cancer is still a bit open. The etiology is still unknown. When I was in Western Australia we got a spike of, of about eight sheep from the one property on the one day at the abattoir 
I hypothesised that it's a chemical. Here we have the lymph nodes of the sheep showing the classical cheesy gland. The one on the left is more firmer showing the onion appearance. The one on the right is more mucopurulent. Outside that mucopurulent area you can see some granulation tissue, the dark yellow. Various etiologies are given over the years. Crinibacterium mobus, Crinibacterium pseudotuberculosis. So once again there's an enormous loss of money to the nation simply because the vaccination program is not pursued strongly enough by government to the farmers. If it were, then the, this disease would be eradicated because the vaccine is quite effective. So once again, we haven't addressed the, the debt, the waste from these millions of dollars which are wasted because the animal health system of Australia is not properly coordinated. This next disease is called eosinophilic myositis because the striated muscle shows many millions of eosinophils in the heart, anywhere in the skeletal muscle and the tongue. It shows small, fusiform, multiple yellow to greenish lesions. Greenish is caused by the presence of the eosinophils. Eosinophilic myositis also occurs in man and whether there's any zoonosis or not is uncertain. Perhaps uh, humans eating the uh, affected beef is still uncertain. The etiology is regarded as sarcocyst, degenerated sarcocyst with a type 1 hypersensitivity type reaction but it's not easy to find uh, mast cells that are degranulated as we find in a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction we find only in the eosinophils and uh, you can just see this fusiform lesions in the muscle with the next one you can see the distribution right throughout the whole of the heart muscle and the next one closer view show those fusiform yellowish greenish lesions where skeletal muscle is obviously affected and of course the uh, carcass would be condemned showing this condition. This next disease is called bovine ocular squamous cell carcinoma or cancer eye. It has its highest prevalence in the Hereford but also it occurs at the abattoirs in other white coated animals. Frisians would be the second highest prevalence after Herefords. It's associated with lack of pigment in or around the eye, sclera. And it shows many different manifestations from very small to very large. And quite frequently, the lesions are so severe that at the abattoirs it's seen as an animal welfare issue. These particular animals should never be permitted to go outside the farm when they're in a very severe condition. But in order to get salvage some money, there is less regard for animal welfare. This is the, the second one here, is the parotid lymph node. The highest frequency of metastases is to the parotid lymph node. On very rare occasions, it passes to the other lymph nodes, the uh, medial, retropharyngeal and on the next one you can see this firm yellow lesion various distribution sometimes it's a rather capitating and a lot more pus from the necrosis of the cancer the meat inspection or carcass disposition is to condemn the carcass when it's metastasized to the local lymph node which is the parotid normally the following images are those as a result of an epidemic or natural outbreak of actinobacillosis at Coonamble, New South Wales, in a feedlot. The local land service veterinarians investigated this. The ones that are sent here to the abattoir are those that were obviously not treatable, but many of them were treated and the lesions resolved. The lesions are mainly found round the head and as you know this 
the name of this disease is wooden tongue, you will see that it's far more than a wooden tongue. Also, the local land service vet said there are many skin lesions on the body in the abdominal region as well. Some sort of contact there in the feedlot situation. So here we have the uh, showing the head lesions, uh, massive lesions in the jaw region, as you can see, underneath the jaw and along the side. Is another one showing the same massive swellings in the uh, jaw region. In the jaw region, when it's in size, one can see the, the pus and central pus and outside that in the next we can see the lymph nodes that are affected in the parotid submandibular medial retropharyngeal and also these lesions were found in the lungs which is unusual because of this massive widespread distribution the carcasses had to be condemned uh, quite often when the lesions are localized just to the head the head is condemned depending upon where the disease is localized. If it's in a terminal lymph node, for, for example, the medial retropharyngeal, there's some justification for condemning the whole carcass, because we don't know exactly where it's gone. But at least having it uh, totally inspected under supervision to see if there are no lesions elsewhere. But because this was so severe, I condemned the whole carcass generalization. So here you can see uh, here, and in the next slide, that there's uh, this mucopurulent exudate in the centre and surrounding that is the uh, granulation tissue, quite a considerable amount of fibrous tissue reaction as well in the region. And also it appeared as though there was invasion of the salivary gland, a closer view in the salivary gland region showing the granulomatous reaction, mucopurulent exudate surrounded by the white fibrous tissue capsule and in this is the incised tongue showing the lesions and when we go to close up you can see those granulomas in the tongue accounting for the name of the disease called wooden tongue but of course it's much more extensive than this as I've just demonstrated now these next series of images from chronic kidney disease of feral goats which I observed at Deniliquin Meat Export Abattoir. These goats were part of an 8,000 goat population and they represent the biggest epidemic of disease ever recorded in feral goats in Australia. The other part is that it is an idiopathic disease. It's still unresolved. Preliminary work at Sydney University revealed calcium oxalate crystals in the urine. So we thought that it was oxalate poisoning from grazing buffalo grass at White Cliffs. This was a disease only on one property. And there's a lot of buffalo grass throughout Northern Australia. And this is not the characteristic disease pattern associated with buffalo grass intoxication. The history of this in the past is that the animals actually die in the acute or hyperacute stages. This is chronic kidney disease. So for that reason, one has led to the belief that the uh, cause is from something else. This requires more investigation. Inorganic and organic chemistry should be done on this at the New South Wales Diagnostic Pathology Service, headed by Dr. Rothwell, and I'm hoping I'll stimulate his interest in this particular disease. As you can see, it's characterized by a large amount of black, slightly greenish, detritus, granular-type material in the pelvis. It extends into the ureter. As you, as you can see, the ureter is dilated in the, the next slide we can see uh, that there is hydronephrosis there's pressure atrophy by the look of it and ure ureter dilatation the next one again hydronephrosis ureter dilation and the next is this granular material various stages and next 
is the same sort of material, close up showing involvement of the cortex. It could be a direct toxicity upon the lamellae affecting the cortex, or it could be pressure effects, I don't know. So here we have growth changes, there's atrophy, hypertrophy, possibly co uh, compensatory. Also I found kidney lesions like this in the fetuses when I, I opened the fetuses of these goats at the abattoirs and the kidneys were affected similar to this. So it's a congenital condition passing through the placenta. Fascinating disease. Let's hope that the New South Wales Elizabeth MacArthur Research Institute Diagnostic Pathology Service will solve this problem in the interest of the feral goat industry. This is part of a continuous epidemiology longitudinal study on wildlife birth in my backyard at Parramatta, New South Wales. And the purpose is to find out from you what your diagnosis is. The normal one, the sulfur crested cockatoo on the left, the abnormal one on the right, and in keeping with the theme of this conference, one could call this bird AIDS, and I want to know why it might be called bird AIDS.